Hello Internet! Time again for Daddy Sage to take over my channel and talk to you about the murder of Laura Foster and the trial and execution of Mr. Thomas Doola. So I will say absolutely nothing this time and just hand it over to the wise old grey-haired man. Enjoy! In this video I will look at the trials, there were two of them, and the appeals. Still, the main source is the surviving trial records. The source to what happened at the execution is mainly an article printed in the New York Herald on May 2nd, 1868, the day after Tom was hanged. Finally, I will tell you a little about what happened after Tom's execution according to the contemporary sources. All drawings and paintings in this video are made by the late Mrs. Edith F. Carter. Mrs. Carter owned and ran the Whippoorwill Academy and Village in Ferguson until her death in 2014. The material is used with her permission. Around September 1st, 1866, the body of Laura Foster was found in a short, shallow grave on a low ridge covered in trees and laurel bushes. The grave was so short that the body was placed on one side with the legs bent up, not broken as the legends tell. Her face was looking up and was covered by some of her clothes. The body was much decomposed and she was identified only by her clothes, a gap between her front teeth and her white cheekbones. Dr. Carter, who examined the body, found one single stab wound in the chest but was not able to determine if the knife had hit the heart or not. The find resulted in Anne Melton being arrested and incarcerated in Wilkes County Jail in Wilkesboro in a cell next to Tom, where he had already been incarcerated for more than one and a half months. Tom's cell is the left one in the upper floor in the picture with the many bars in front of the windows, while Anne's cell is the, to the right on the same floor. Wills County Jail was built in 1858 and considered one of the most modern and secure prisons of its time. Today it serves as a museum and can be visited on guided tours from Wilkes Heritage Museum. The trial was set for the fall term of the Superior Court in Wilkes County, which was to begin the fifth Monday after the last Monday in August, which was actually October 1st. On October 1st the legal procedures began with a hearing before a grand jury in the old courthouse in Wilkesboro. This courthouse is long gone and the present old courthouse is from 1902. Twenty people were called by the prosecution to give testimony before the grand jury, and they came to the conclusion that the evidence presented by Prosecutor Caldwell was strong enough to indict both Tom and Anne. Tom was indicted for first-degree murder. During the hearing, the prosecution reduced the charges against Anne to conspiracy and instigation to commit murder, which in itself were punishable by death. The indictment contained a couple of surprising facts, uh, if you could call them facts. The grand jury knew, according to the indictment, that the knife used to kill Laura was worth five cents, even if, even if no murder weapon was ever found. They also knew that Tom has used his right hand for the murder, even if, even if there were no witnesses to the crime. And most surprising, they knew that the murder had taken place on Monday, June 18th, not May 25th. The date of the murder is handled in a very confusing way in different official records, which I will not get into here, but I can add that in the verdict from the Supreme Court, the murder is said to have taken place on January 25th. The bill of indictment was written in the traditional, hard to read and understand legal language of the time. A short quote from the last part of the indictment. I quote, And the jurors aforesaid upon their oath aforesaid to further present that Anne Melton, late of the county aforesaid, well knowing the said Tom Dooley, to have done and committed the said felony and murder in a manner and form aforesaid, afterwards to wit, and I could go on, on like that. The trial date was set for October 4th, 1866. When the trial opened, Sebulon Vance asked for a transfer of venue as Tom and Anne couldn't get a fair trial in Wilkes County where the case was well known to most people and it would be impossible to find impartial jurors. This was granted 
and the trial was transferred to neighboring Iredale County two weeks later. The judge instructed the sheriff of Wills County to present the prisoners in Iredale County on Thursday, October 18th, the day before the trial would begin. As the old wooden Iredale County Jail was not nearly as secure as a brick jail in Wilkesboro, the Iredale County Sheriff was authorized to hire an additional guard of eight men to protect the prisoners. The trial opened in Iredale County in the courthouse in Statesville on Friday, October 19, 1866. The trial lasted for two days, which was a very long time for a trial in those days. The prosecution team consisted of district attorney for the 6th Judicial District, Walter P. Caldwell, assistant prosecutor Nathaniel Boyden, the man without head in the picture, and assistant prosecutor John Clement, all were Republicans which may have in, played a part in their decision. On the defense team were former North Carolina wartime governor Sebulon Vance, assisted by Richard M. Allison and Robert F. Armfield, all Democrats. The judge in the grand jury hearing and the first trial was Ralph P. Buxton, also a Republican. Seb Vance requested that the trials against Tom and Anne were to be run separately so that none of them would say anything that could incriminate the other. This was granted, and it was decided that Tom's trial was to be held first. This meant that Anne didn't go to trial until two years later. Around 60 witnesses gave around 100 testimonies during the two trials against Tom. Unfortunately, only around 20 of these testimonies still exist, 15 for the prosecution and 5 for the defense. None of them exist in a verbatim form since there were no minutes of the proceedings. What exists is a record of the testimonies as they were remembered by the court clerk and the judge. When the case was appealed, the two of them had to provide the Supreme Court with the contents of relevant testimonies, and this is all we have today. Before the testimonies were given, the prosecutor stated that he expected to prove the charges against Tom Dooley by circumstantial evidence that he expected to show a criminal intimacy had existed between Tom Dooley and Laura Foster, the deceased, also between the prisoner and Anne Melton, a married woman who was the wife of James Melton. He expected to show further that the prisoner had contracted a venereal disease from the deceased and has communicated it to Mrs. Anne Melton, that he had uttered threats against the deceased because of the disease, and so on and so on. I will not go into any details about the testimonies, as it would be a long and boring process, but I will get back to some of them in the coming videos. After all the testimonies were presented, the case closed. The most damaging testimony, in my opinion, came from Betsy Scott, who claimed that Laura had told her that she was going to meet Tom Dula at Bates Place. The defense objected to this, as well as other statements as hearsay, but to no avail. The case lasted both Friday and Saturday, a very long time at the time. After having been instructed by the judge, the jury retired. The jury deliberated all night to return Sunday morning with a guilty verdict. The defense tried to achieve an arrest of judgment due to different arguments, but was overruled by the judge, and Tom Dooley was sentenced to be hanged on November 9, 1866. The defense then asked for an appeal to the Supreme Court, which was granted. The Supreme Court was at that time housed in the Capitol building in Raleigh. The Supreme Court was led by three judges, and the president was Richard Mumford Pearson, a well-known lawyer. The Supreme Court did and do not rule on guilt or sentencing but only decides if correct legal procedure had been used and if the law has been applied correctly. No lawyers were present and no witnesses were heard. The Supreme Court considered the case and ruled that the statements from Betsy Scott should not have been allowed as it was considered hearsay and not part of the so-called res gestae, which means things done, as not part of Laura's actual actions when speaking with Betsy. The other reasons for the appeal were rejected. I quote, 
In this case, the conversation between Mrs. Scott and the deceased, although it occurred at the time of the action or thing being done, to wit, her being on the road on her father's mare, bareback, cannot, in any point of view, be considered a part of the act." Unquote. The ruling was given per curiam, which means that it was not mentioned if all three judges agreed in the verdict. It called for a veneer de novo, which means a new trial. Tom was to remain in jail until a new trial could take place in the spring term of Iredell County Superior Court. On Wednesday, April 17, 1867, the trial began in Iredell with, with Judge Robert Gallion presiding. It didn't last long, though, as the defense requested a postponement as three important witnesses, F. F. Hendricks from Caldwell County and Mary James and Francis Farmer from Watauga County were not present. The postponement to the fall term of 1867 was granted. On Thursday, October 16, 1867, the case come on again, this time with Judge Alexander Little presiding. Once again, the case was postponed. This time it was the prosecution that was missing three witnesses, James Simmons, Lucinda Gordon and James Grayson. Only Grayson is known to us today as he was the Tennessee colonel who helped to arrest Tom. Interesting it is though that none of these six witnesses were called in the first trial and none of them were called in the final trial, even if they were so important that the case had to be postponed twice. Along the way, a lot of serious and less serious cases, not only the Doula case, had been piling up in Iredell County, and Governor Jonathan Worth was authorized by the North Carolina Congress to establish a court of Oyer and Terminer. As president of this court, the governor appointed Judge William M. Shipp. Shipp was a Republican and later in life became a Democrat after having lost an election as a Supreme Court judge on a Republican bill in the summer of 1868. In 1870, he was elected North Carolina general attorney on a Democrat bill, even if every other Democrat lost the election. Judge Shipp decided that the Court of Oyer and Terminer should commence its work on January 20th, 1868. Tom Dooley's case was started on Tuesday 21st. Before this trial, Robert Armfield had left the defense team and had been replaced by David M. Furches, who actually was a Republican, the only one on the team. During his second trial, the same witnesses were heard and apparently gave the same testimonies. A few new witnesses testified, but their testimonies are not known today. As mentioned earlier, none of the witnesses that caused the two postponements testified in the trial. This time the trial lasted for three whole days, but the jury only deliberated for about two hours and once again Tom was found guilty and Judge Shipp sent him, sentenced him to be hanged on February 14th. Once again Tom was allowed an appeal. The court clerk sent the same excerpt from the trial to the Supreme Court as he had sent after the first trial, but the, so the Supreme Court was not satisfied. So Clark Summers, together with Judge Shipp, made a summary of the trial, and apparently that satisfied the Supreme Court judges. This time, the Supreme Court found that no procedural errors had been made. Vance had two specific reasons for the appeal. One was that Anne had said to the little girl when she sent her to get Tom should not have been allowed, but the Supreme Court found it was part of the rest gesti, the act of sending the girl. The other main reason for the appeal was that Vance had asked a question to Eliza Anderson, a younger sister of George Washington Anderson, about her relationship with John Anderson, a colored man. This question was not allowed by Judge Shipp, and even if the Supreme Court found that it should have been allowed, the defense had not proven its significance to the case, so a new trial was denied. As February 14 had come and gone, a new date of execution was to be set at the spring term of Iredell Superior Court. On April 14th, Judge Anderson Mitchell finally could set a date for the execution, which was to take place on May 1st, 1868. On that day, he be taken by the Sheriff of Set County to the place of public execution of Set County, 
between the hours of 12 noon and 4, and there be hanged by the neck until he be dead. Tom remained in jail until the day of his execution. On Saturday, April 25th, Anne Melton was transferred back to Wilkes County Jail. As Wilkes County paid for her stay in Iredale County Jail, they probably thought that they could save some money by taking her back now that Tom had been convicted. As there was no place of public execution in Statesville, the sheriff had erected a simple gallows on a field next to the railway depot south of town, a place commonly known as the Circus Lot. The gallows consisted of two uprights, 10 feet apart with a single crossbar on top to which the rope could be fastened. On the evening of Thursday, April 30th, Tom had his di dinner as usual, but when the jailer was about to leave, he discovered that one of Tom's shackles was loosened by Tom filing through the chain with a piece of glass he had hidden in his bed. He told the jailer that he had been like that for a month, thus indicating that he hadn't done it in an attempt to escape, but the shackle was replaced anyway. Sometime after the jail, jailer had left the cell, Tom got a visit from assistant defense lawyer Richard Allison. Tom handed Allison a piece of paper in which he claimed to be the only one involved in the murder, but he made Allison promise that he would not tell anybody before Tom was dead. He also handed him a 15-page long statement of his life. Unfortunately, neither the confession nor the statements have survived. After Allison had left, Tom consulted his spiritual advisor, but even to him he didn't admit to anything. In the morning he was baptized by a Methodist priest. Friday, May 1st was a wonderful spring day. The sun was shining and the birds were singing. From the morning large crowds of people gathered in the streets of Statesville. Some had even arrived the previous day. To avoid trouble, the sheriff had ordered all bars to close and had appointed a special guard to keep back the crowd and to prevent drunkards from making trouble. Sources contemporary to the case claim that around 3,000 people were flocking in the streets, a large number for a town which at that time only counted around six or 700 inhabitants. Many of these spectators were from Wilkes, Caldwell and other neighboring counties who had come to watch Tom die. Among these were a lot of women and children to the amazement of at least one young girl who stated so in a letter to her father the very same day as the execution took place. It was also from this letter that I know about the weather and the singing birds. The New York Herald reporter estimated there were an equal number of males and females. At the actual place of execution, people were climbing the trees and the roof of the railway depot in order to get a good look. At 12.42 a guard was formed and Tom was led from the prison by Sheriff Vasson and some assistants. Tom climbed the cart that also carried his coffin. He was accompanied in the cart by his brother-in-law while his sister walked beside the cart. Along the way he spoke with his sister, telling her not to worry about him as he had made peace with God. Contrary to what legends tell, Tom did not play his banjo or sang as he sat on his coffin. At 1.08 the cart arrived at the place of execution and some of the sheriff's men on horseback had to spread the crowd in order for the cart to get through. When the cart was placed under the gallows, Sheriff Vasson placed the rope around Tom's neck and told him that he could address the crowd if he wanted to. Many of the crowd expected to hear him confess to the murder and repent, but neither did he confess nor did he repent, quite the contrary. Tom spoke out in a loud and clear voice of his childhood, his parents and his time in the army. He spoke a bit about politics and accused the newly elected governor, William Holden, of being a secessionist who could not be trusted. I have to say that William Holden was definitely not a secessionist. He didn't mention the murder, but for some reason he spoke about the roads and paths leading to the place of the murder. He swore by God that some of the witnesses had, at his trial had sworn falsely against him, especially about his whereabouts on Thursday and Friday. He named in particular one man, 
Colonel James Isbell, that he claimed was prejudiced against him and had committed perjury during trial. Pauline was not mentioned, and neither was Anne, as she didn't testify at Tom's trial, even if she was present all days. Tom concludes his hour-long speech by declaring that without the lies being sworn against him, he wouldn't be standing at the gallows at all. So he maintained his claim of innocence to the last moment. When he was done talking to the crowd, he said goodbye to his sister, and the end of the rope was tied to the crossbeam of the gallows. At 2.24 p.m., the cart was pulled away, and Tom fell around two feet. His neck didn't break, and he drew breath for five more minutes, but hung from the rope without struggling. After 10 minutes, his heart stopped beating, and at 2.37, the present physician, Dr. Campbell, declared him dead. 20 minutes later, the body was taken down and put in the coffin, which was handed over to his sister Anna and her husband, Mikaja Hendricks. Mr. Allison can't have waited too long to publish Tom's alleged confession, as the New York Herald could bring the, its wording already in the May 2nd issue, one day after the execution. Anna and her husband brought the coffin back to Elkville. Some later sources claim that Tom's body was removed from the coffin and placed on his bed for people to, to, to say goodbye to him, but this cannot be verified by official records. Tom was buried across the river about one and a half miles from his own home in a family cemetery, which were on land that once belonged to his grandfather, but was now owned by his uncle. An ordinary flat stone from the riverbed with no inscriptions or anything was placed on the grave as was customary. When you are buried in a family plot, everyone who cares knows who is buried where and no tombstone is needed. The tombstone in the picture was erected on the grave in 1958 or 1959 after the Kingston Trio song had made the case famous again. It's on private property, and as it had been vandalized by souvenir hunters, there's no longer access to it. The original stone is now in the Tom Dooley Art Museum at the Whipperwill Academy and Village in Ferguson, where also the original stone from Anne Melton's grave can be seen. At the fall term of Wilkes County, 1868, Anne was tried before the Wilkes County Superior Court. No records exist from this trial, but we know that Anne was acquitted of all charges. Some think that it was because of Tom's confession, while other later sources will know that it was because nobody would testify against her. Anne returned to her husband James, and the two of them lived together for the rest of her life. In 1871, Anne had another daughter, Ida Warren Melton. Anne died in late 1873 or early 1874, most likely from injuries after an accident when an ox cart turned over and fell upon her. At least one author thinks, though, that she died of syphilis in the terminal phase of the third stage. A lot of legends of what Anne may or may not have said on her deathbed and to whom exist today, but none of them are from sources contemporary with the case. Most of these legendary stories, though, agree on her having said something that would have saved Tom from the gallows. Some time after the execution and before the 1870 census, Tom's mother sold her property to Dr. Carter. She and her daughter Eliza moved in with her daughter Anna and her family. She spent the rest of her life here. When Annie and MKJ died, Eliza moved on and lived for the rest of her life on her own. Many years later, the Carter family tore down the buildings on the old Dula plot, and today a modern home stands in the place where once famous or infamous Tom Dooley lived. A few years after Anne's death, James Melton married Louise Gilbert, a niece of Tom's second cousin, Rufus D. Hall, and they lived the remainder of their life, him as a respected man in the community. Tom's eager pursuer, James Isbell, died in 1913, but apparently never spoke of the case. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, his son, Robert Lee Isbell, wrote a series of newspaper articles about his childhood. He mentioned the case 
but it is clear that he didn't have his knowledge from a first-hand source like his father, but from oral tradition. After Tom Dooley's trial and execution, assistant prosecutor John Clement refused to prosecute cases where the death penalty could be the result of a guilty verdict. Sebulon Vance never talked about the Dooley case or mentioned it in any letters or other papers, and his partner in law in the law firm, Clement Dowd, who wrote a very detailed 500-page Vance biography, didn't mention this case with a single word, even if other of Vance's lost cases were mentioned, and even if this was most likely the highest profiled mo murder case in his career. This video completes the description of the case as it is known from contemporary sources. In my next installments, I will look into some of the many discrepancies of the case, like why Tom was convicted on such a flimsy basis, why nobody involved liked to talk about the case, how the prosecution managed to get everyday actions to look suspicious, and much more. In some future video, I may even get to my own idea of who killed Laura Foster and why. Hey ho and a bottle of rum, this was all from Daddy Sage for now. Until next time, stay safe, keep warm, have fun and enjoy life's great and small pleasures. Goodbye. And there you go. Once more Daddy Sage has informed you about the trial of the century that no one apparently knew in that particular century and he seemed to have gone all piratey on us there at the end. However, I hope you enjoyed this foray into North Carolina legal history and look forward to the next one coming out really soon. Until then, I have been the Sage and I wish you all a very happy